Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jessica Cheshire with the New York State Science and Technology Law Center at Syracuse University College of Law, and I would like to introduce our presenter today, um, Professor Shuba Ghosh, Director of the Technology Commercialization Law Program at the Syracuse University College of Law, and he will be presenting today on recent and upcoming Supreme Court IP-related cases. Thank you, Jess. And uh, thank you to the audience uh, for participating, registering. I guess this is launching the webinar series for fall of, of this academic year, and we have some great programs lined up that you can find out more about from our, from our web page and uh, from our listservs and so forth. Uh, today, I'm going to pick up with some things that I did last, uh, last spring on some cases regarding uh, intellectual property at the Supreme Court and let you know how they came out. With, um, and give you some analysis of those cases, as well as talking about some of the upcoming cases. This, this is going to be a rich year, uh, people are saying. Uh, there are at least already four cases, and there are possibly one or two more that the Supreme Court uh, might uh, grant a review of. And so we'll talk about this. So we've got a total of three cases from last term, four this term. So that's seven cases to talk about in the next hour. But the rich cases, uh, lots of interesting detail and lots of interesting practice pointers that, that can come up. So welcome, and uh, I look forward to your questions and any comments you might have either during the presentation. Feel free to, uh, to text those in or email those in, and uh, look forward even to hearing from some of you after the, uh, after the presentation. So the overview, as I mentioned, is to discuss the three cases from last term and then the four upcoming cases. Uh, for the 2016 term, uh, talk about the relevance for practice. Uh, these cases um, range from patents to copyrights to some trademark law, potentially. And so they have a wide range of uh, practical applications that we'll talk about today. And then uh, we'll talk specifically within the broader world of practice to the specific practice area of, of tech transfer and transactions, which is the focus of our, of our center and tends to be one of the big themes in this uh, webinar series. So the cases that were decided last term, there were three. Two of them, some of you may remember, there were some webinar presentations that I gave on each of the first two uh, last year. And so the first one is Halo versus Pulse. I did a webinar series on that last March. And this had to do with the standard for getting enhanced damages in patent law. Um, the, the long and short of it is that the Supreme Court has overruled uh, the, the Federal Circuit and effectively has made it easier to get enhanced damages or at least changing the standard in a way that may, may be lowering, lowering it. The next case was the heavily watched Quozo Speed Technologies versus Lee. We had a webinar about this in, in April of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of this year. That had to do with inter partes review and the standard for uh, deciding uh, whether to grant inter partes review as well as what the standard is for, sta for patent uh, interpretation uh, within that proceeding and by the, P P by the PTO. Uh, basically, the bottom line is that the, the Supreme Court affirmed the broadest reasonable interpretation standard and a lack of judicial review of U.S. PTO decision uh, on inter partes review. So I'll you know, spend a lot of time talking about this uh, in April. I'll review some of those materials that we talked about in April, but give it a spin based upon how the court actually uh, decided the cases. Uh, in some ways, neither of these cases were that surprising in terms of the result, uh, but they're both pretty important cases about the practice with both with before the, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office as well as in front of uh, federal, federal courts. The third case, we didn't really talk about that much uh, during the last season of, this, of these webinar. But it's an important case regarding attorney's fees in, in copyright suits. And this is the Kirtsang versus John Wiley case. There was a previous iteration of this case uh, about two years ago where the Supreme Court looked at this question of international exhaustion. So that um, question is whether a sale of a copyrighted work uh, anywhere in, in, in the world would exhaust the rights under U.S. law. And so that case was important. Well, that aspect of the case was important because of this principle of international exhaustion. And this went down again to the uh, lower courts and then now came back up to the Supreme Court on the issue of the standard for attorney's fees in copyright suits. Uh, 
And as some of you may know, that's been a big issue in the area of patent law. And so the court granted cert uh, to look at this issue in the context of, of copyright. So we didn't talk about this last spring, but we'll talk briefly about it in the context of uh, our discussion today. So the four cases for, for this term are pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, the, they kind of cover a wide range uh, of areas. And uh, one, of the, one of the interesting um, uh, uh, sort of general notions that come up in these cases is this protection for design, uh, whether under copyright law or under patent law. Um, so we um, haven't seen that many design cases that have gone up to the U.S. Supreme Court in a long time, but this term we have two of them, and so those would be very important for the, because that's a growing area of, um, of uh, intellectual property uh, work. And so the first of these design cases is Varsity Brands versus Star Athletica. I didn't check the calendar I, I don't, uh, when, when they've been slated for oral argument, but I can, uh, you know, if there are any questions about that, I can look that up separately. But this is a case that was heavily watched. It has to do with uh, the standard for copyright protection of designs, and specifically the work at issue, as we'll see a little bit later on, are cheerleader uniforms. So um, uh, the ruling in this case goes beyond that, but it's kind of an interesting area, closely watched, something that affects um, the fashion industry more broadly and also affects uh, universities and schools uh, and so forth that might uh, uh, design some of these costumes. Uh, the next case is SCA Hygiene Products, Actiobalag versus First Quality Baby Products. Uh, and this has to do with latches in patent infringement suits. So there was a case a couple, of, um, uh, a couple of terms ago regarding latches in the context of, um, of copyright uh, infringement suits. And uh, the court uh, basically looked at uh, uh, the statute rather than looking at these common law rules of latches. And uh, the court now is addressing this issue in terms of the statute of limitation under the statute versus any equitable rules like latches in the context of, of patent infringements. So it's an interesting case on its own terms, but also interesting to see whether the court does something different for patent law uh, than it did uh, for copyright law. The third case was really heavily watched, uh, Apple versus Samsung, having to do with the litigation over the, uh, the design of the, uh, of the iPhone. This got a lot of press uh, for lower court rulings regarding this case. And so the interesting issue that's coming up here for, before the U.S. Supreme Court is what should the me measure of damages be for design patent infringement? Should it be the entire product or should, should there be some sort of apportionment uh, for the actual uh, design that was infringed uh, separately from uh, the product? So this, you know, if the court does find it for apportionment, it'll be interesting to see what type of um, suggestions it might have regarding how to apportion. But the underlying question itself is interesting because the statute seems to suggest no apportionment, uh, even though there are lots of good arguments for why there should be apportionment as a matter of policy and as a matter of, uh, of equity uh, in, in these design patent cases. The, la the last case is Life Technologies versus Promega Corporation. And this has to do with uh, patent infringement liability for, for inducement. Uh, it's, it's a series of cases under 271F of the, of the Patent Act uh, having to do with situations where a, a, patented, um, a patented item is uh, assembled overseas and then re-imported into the U.S. Uh, to what extent uh, can there be patent infringement for making it, even though the making technically occurred uh, outside the U.S. Uh, so we'll talk about this and what makes uh, the Promega case different from, uh, from predecessor uh, cases is that in this case it has to do with, uh, with uh, a process or at least a combination process and, and product while the previous cases uh, had to do with, uh, with products. So we'll talk about all four of these cases very briefly and then we may have separate, uh, very likely we'll have separate webinars as these cases are argued. Uh, in, in the next uh, upcoming uh, uh, months. So let's talk about the first in this series, Halo versus Stryker, which is the standard for enhanced uh, patent damages. This decision uh, came down, I think, last May. We had our webinar in, in March, and we had a pretty good discussion about uh, you know, how uh, this case should turn out. The issue had to do with uh, Section 284 of the, of the Patent Act, 
which basically says that upon finding for the claimant, the court shall award the claimant damages adequate to compensate uh, for infringement, and then goes on to say that when the damages are not found by a jury, the court shall assess them, and whether a jury or a judge assesses the damages, the court may increase the damages up to three times the amount found or assessed. And so the question is, what is the standard for increasing damages? Uh, is it purely up to the district court discretion, or is there some sort of structured uh, standard or rule that the district court must follow in terms of deciding uh, when a case is appropriate for, uh, for treble damages? And so the leading case from the Federal Circuit on this, on this matter was In re Seagate, and uh, we'll talk about that in, in more detail, but the bottom line is In re Seagate has been overruled. Uh, in the In re Seagate case, the, the court had, uh, the Federal Circuit had established a two-part test uh, that's both objective and subjective, requiring both a subjective showing of, of willfulness as well as a subjective showing of willfulness. And um, the thing that made this a little bit more in interesting than that two-part test is that the court would never get to the subjective prong if uh, the, the plaintiff, the patent donor, could not establish that there was no objective basis uh, for willfulness on the part of the infringer. What that means in practice, uh, you know, why these cases got so controversial, is there might be a situation where uh, an alleged infringer uh, basically said at the time uh, that the infringement occurred, you know, we don't care, uh, we'll just take the risk. Uh, they may have even subjectively known that the patent existed, but they infringed anyway. But then at the time of litigation, they're able to show that there was some sort of objective basis for challenging uh, the patent, that th there's some objective basis for why the patent may have been invalid. And that's meant to undercut any objective basis for, for willfulness. And so the uh, patent owners uh, objected to, to, to this two-part test largely because after the fact, in other words, after infringement, the infringer could come up with any evidence um, to show or you know, has a wide latitude in terms of coming up with evidence to show that, look, there is this prior art or there is this, this act that could have potentially have been a public use or an on sale uh, that, that, would, that would potentially invalidate the patent. And an objective person, a uh, reasonable person, could have looked at, this, at these facts and assumed that the patent was invalid. And even though at the time of infringement, the infringer really didn't care. It kind of threw caution to the wind and just simply infringed the patent. So this kind of after the fact, almost manufactured defense of invalidity. Of course, if the invalidity defense is valid, we don't even get to damages because there isn't any infringement. But really the question is whether just by bringing in this objective uh, evidence, uh, the court is correct in simply not getting or putting any weight on the subjective prong of the two-part test. And so the bottom line really boiled down to, you know, whether this two-part test that the Federal Circuit uh, devised uh, is appropriate. And um, the Supreme Court, as I mentioned, ends up basically overruling Seagate and adopting a different standard. And we'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. And so one of the, one of the issues that was raised by the, uh, by, by the parties in this case is, the Supreme Court's ruling in Octane Fitness versus Icon Health, which had to do with exceptional cases. And so in this case, uh, decided uh, two years ago, the court uh, again addressed a two-part test divide, devised by the Federal Circuit in the Brooks Furniture case from 2005. And under that two-part test, uh, the uh, exceptional cases were ones, again, where there was no objective basis for the party to raise a, a defense or a claim, uh, and there was, no, there was a subjective basis on the part of the, 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 uh, uh, the, the losing party to, uh, to get, um, uh, um, uh, to, to, uh, uh, in terms of bringing the claim or bringing some sort of frivolous claim or frivolous defense. So the, there was a lot of parallels, and these came up in the oral arguments between the 285 situation and the 284 uh, situation. Uh, the court in Octane Fitness basically said that uh, uh, exceptional cases should not be based upon this two-pronged test. They basically lowered the standard. But there is an asymmetry between 284 and 285 that we talked about last, uh, that last April. A 285 can apply to both uh, a plaintiff or a defendant. Um, whoever wins this lawsuit then, then can pursue attorney's fees. Uh, 
and uh, lowering the standard benefits both the plaintiff, the patent owner, uh, and the defendant uh, in general, because either, either party could be, a, be a, the winner in, in any given case. Under 284, 284 has to do with treble damages. That only arises, of course, if the patent owner wins. So lowering the standard for treble damages or enhanced damages would clearly benefit patent owners. And so the argument was raised by, uh, by the defendants in that case and had a lot of sway, in, at least in oral argument, that the standard should be higher for, for enhanced damages in order to deal with a frivolous patent litigation bought by, brought by non-practicing entities or patent trolls or whatever the, uh, the term of the, the day might be for, for those types of uh, 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 litigants. So that argument sort of went back and forth. The bottom line is that the court, you know, in some ways lowered the standard for both attorney's fees and for treble damages, lowering the, the burden or the, the, the standard for, a turn, for treble damages certainly benefited patent owners. And then the earlier ruling that lowered the standard for, uh, for the recovery of attorney's fees really benefits both uh, in the long run. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, who you'd predict to be benefiting from, from any particular given rule. Uh, lots of discussion in 285 about how district courts should then decide when a case is exceptional and whether they should target, um, you know, uh, non-practicing entities, especially uh, in terms of uh, situations where they brought a lawsuit and lost and therefore then should be penalized through some sort of fee shifting. Uh, and so the debate is continuing as to the effects of, of, of uh, uh, these different rulings on, on patent litigation. So let, let me give you a little bit more context and understanding for what the court did in these cases. Uh, here are the, the, the various uh, questions that went in, in front of the court, uh, basically in the, in the HALO case. These are two separate uh, cases that were consolidated. The case uh, that the question that the court was looking at is uh, sort of an amalgam of the first two, whether the federal circuit erred by applying a rigid two-part test for enhancing patent infringement damages under 35 U.S.C. Section 284. That is the same as the rigid two-part test. In other words, should there be more symmetry between 284 and 285, was this rigid two-part test wrong? And then the second question is, does a district court have discretion under Section 284 to award enhanced damages where an infringer intentionally copied a direct competitor's patent invention, uh, knew the invention was covered by multiple patents, and made no attempt to avoid infringing the patents on that invention? And in some ways, the second question regarding discretion was more important for the court. Uh, the court does rule that there should be a lowered standard, that they reject this two-part test. But one of the reasons, and maybe the principal reason why they do this, is that they wanted to give more discretion to the district court. And that has several implications. One is that the district courts are in a better position to determine uh, whether uh, enhanced damages are appropriate, just like they may be in a better, better position to determine whether attorney's fees should be awarded to the winning party. And it's also the situation where in some ways the court is, get, is getting more skeptical of the federal circuit. And so often these decisions by the Supreme Court, especially in patent law, really are reflecting some sort of a tension between the Supreme Court and the federal circuit. And by adopting a rule in both cases where more discretion is being given to the district court, not only is the Supreme Court sort of recognizing sort of functionally and structurally the role of the district court in, in understanding and, and, and controlling patent litigation, but also maybe some sort of skepticism about the federal circuit intervening and coming up with more structured uh, bright line rules that are meant to limit district court discretion. Uh, there is sort of a shift in the decision making power in these cases, especially in HALO, from the federal circuit uh, to the district court. And so when you look at the holding in, 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 in the HALO case, uh, there are a couple of things to, uh, to, to point out, just to summarize here a little bit, that this was a unanimous decision. Uh, remember, Justice Scalia had passed away in uh, February of this year, so only eight justices still. Um, 
And so eight, eight, all eight of them decided uh, to lower the standard. All eight of them agreed that the Federal Circuit's two-part test from Seagate should be overruled, so Seagate is no longer a good law. And all eight of them agreed, though there was different emphases on why, but certainly Justice Roberts writing the opinion really emphasized the need to grant discretion to the district court in awarding enhanced damages. So lots of really interesting discussion from some of the other justices as to why a lower standard uh, for enhanced damages uh, is appropriate. A lot of it was couched in terms of helping the patent owner, even if some of the patent owners uh, may be bringing frivolous litigation. Uh, there's a general sense that uh, 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 having a lower standard, making it easier to get enhanced damages, has some benefit for the patent system and for patent owners. Uh, with Justice Roberts and other justices that joined in, the, in, the, in his opinion, basically emphasizing the important structural role of the district court uh, in awarding uh, enhanced damages. Uh, and so this compares with um, uh, the Octane Fitness case where again uh, the court rejected a two-part test that was devised by the Federal Circuit giving the district court more discretion uh, in, in deciding when attorney fees should be shifted in exceptional cases. Again, these types of the situation under 285 uh, is, is in some ways is symmetric. It's not one-sided like the enhanced damages cases. So this lower standard could potentially help both patent owners when they win and obviously uh, infringers when they win. And that's kind of an important point to emphasize because cases after, uh, after Octane Fitness have been one where they seem to be uh, a, 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 a more leniency in, in awarding uh, attorney's fees. And a lot of these cases are ones where the patent owner does tend to win. And the ones in which the, uh, the, the infringer wins and gets attorney's fees seem to be ones where the patent owner either did not have a viable claim or there was some question about the validity of the patent and so forth. So it doesn't seem, at least from the two years since Octane Fitness was decided, that this new standard is being really used uh, extensively to police you know, non-practicing entities and patent trolls. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens with this, um, the willfulness standard for enhanced damages, whether in fact district courts will uh, award enhanced damages uh, more often. And that's something to look out for uh, as to exactly what the, what the standard would be in those types of cases, especially the role of uh, subjective willfulness. Uh, it seems like it's no longer the case that the, a patent infringer can say, well, maybe, maybe we were subjectively willful, but a reasonable person would have recognized or thought that the, uh, the patent was invalid and that, therefore that should be enough to not award attorney's fees, excuse me, not award enhanced damages. And it's possible that that line of, uh, of attack by, uh, by unsuccessful infringers is probably shut off now once Seagate is out the, out the door. So let's now talk to Quozo, uh, talk about Quozo versus Lee. Uh, this involves the inter partes review proceedings. Uh, some of these things, uh, you know, will be, will be a review, but it's probably worth going into this in, in some detail because of the importance in inter partes review. And so some of these who saw our presentation back in April, some of these comments may be familiar, but I'll enhance them a little bit in light of the, uh, uh, of the, the ruling in the, in the court. Basically, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office wins. So Lee is the commissioner of uh, patents, and so uh, she's representing the interests of the patent office, and uh, they end up winning, essentially, in this case, both on the, the, the standard for interpreting patent claims as well as on the discretion given to the, uh, the PTAB on when to uh, bring a uh, bring a IPR action. Okay, so uh, the oral arguments were in April of this year. I think we had the um, the the webinar probably a few days or a week beforehand. <coughs> Excuse me. Two cases in front of the that the court were the two questions that the court were dealing with. Uh, whether the court of appeals erred in holding that in IPR proceedings. The board may construe claims in their broadest reasonable interpretation rather than their plain and ordinary meaning. Court of Appeals here being the Federal Circuit, the Supreme Court here rules in favor of the Federal Circuit. A broadest reasonable interpretation is an appropriate standard. Uh, 
in the context of proceedings uh, that are in the USPTO for understanding what claims mean. And the second question was whether the Court of Appeals erred in holding that even if the Board exceeds its statutory authority in instituting an IPR proceeding, the Board's decision and whether to institute an IPR proceeding is judicially reviewable. Again, the statute clearly limits judicial review on whether an IPR is granted by the Board on that decision. And the Court again rules uh, up affirming the Federal Circuit saying that um, uh, this uh, is not subject to judicial review, uh, uh, interlock under in interlocutory review, uh, and the court, you know, kind of goes on on this to suggest that there might be other avenues of review based upon uh, administrative procedure, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But basically affirming the federal circuit, as well as affirming uh, uh, patent office practice, as well as what's in the, in the statute. So just to kind of review a little bit, about what inter partes reviews are. Now, this allows someone other than the owner of a patent, uh, you, if you're not the owner of the patent uh, who's bringing this, you need to identify the real parties of interest uh, in, in the particular case, either they potential infringers, are they somehow connected to the patent owner, whatever it might be. Uh, and it allows this other party to petition the USPTO to invalidate patent claims on the grounds of lack of novelty or non-obviousness based on prior art patents and publications. And these can be brought either nine months after the grant of a patent or after the termination of any post-grant review of the patent. Okay, so we'll talk about post-grant review separately. Inter partes review is one of these uh, post-grant opposition proceedings that were introduced by the, uh, uh, the uh, American Invents Act uh, in 2011, went into effect in 2012, with the post-grant review proceedings going into effect uh, a few years afterwards. So even though the, the particular uh, procedure at issue in this case is inter partes review, as we'll see, there's some parallel uh, statutory provisions uh, for post-grant reviews and the reasoning in, the, in this decision would, would most likely apply to post-grant reviews as well. So there's a two-step process for review by the Patent and Trademark Appeals Board or the PTAB. The first is whether to institute the proceeding and that's before uh, one uh, administrative law judge or ALJ. The standard under, for the PGR to be instituted is it's more likely than not or there's some novel or unsettled legal question. Uh, that's being brought by the challenger. Uh, for the IPR, the standard is one of reasonable likelihood uh, that the patent might be invalidated. And under 314D, uh, the decision to institute the proceeding is final and non-appealable. And this is one of the issues that was, that was raised in the, the Quozo case. Does final and non-appealable actually mean final and non-appealable? Uh, and the court said yes, essentially. Um, and then finally, the second step uh, of the process is uh, once the proceeding has been instituted, is there a question, Jess, or no? Okay, the second, the, second, the process, second step is whether there are grounds uh, that uh, exist for invalidation of the patent. And this is determined before a panel of three administrative law judges. And here's where the, the, the other question comes up. In this particular situation, the, uh, the panel has to come up with an understanding of what the, the claims mean. So if they're trying to invalidate the claims, they don't do that in the abstract. They have to have an understanding of what the claims mean. We all know that in the context of litigation, there's a Markman hearing. Uh, no Markman hearing within the, within the context of the, uh, the IPR or this administrative proceeding. So the practice, uh, both uh, for these types of proceedings and then also, of course, uh, for, for any prosecution, has been to use the broadest reasonable interpretation. So in other words, I, can kind, of, I kind of view this as sort of a, a beta test or a control test. Uh, give the widest latitude uh, for what the claims could mean. If they survive a challenge, then that's, that's pretty strong a basis for saying that the claims would be, in, would be validated, even if you did take a narrower reading, let's say, through, through, uh, through a Markman hearing process. So broadest reasonable interpretation was the standard, goes back at least to 1906, a uh, decision from a commissioner of patents in the Pottlesack case. Um, <coughs> you see an affirmation of the standard as recently in 2014. 
and the Rambus decision, long pedigree, and this was very important for the Supreme Court to basically say, uh, we don't really have any basis to overrule this standard, this, the patent office has been using it, and therefore they, they do affirm uh, this practice of using uh, the broadest reasonable interpretation. So here it's good to um, think about litigation in the context of this, and this could be uh, important uh, for how, uh, uh, you know, for some of the implications of uh, Quozo, and certainly did come up in the context of the oral argument for Quozo, uh, and, this, and the opinion also talks about some of these implications for litigation. Uh, the IPR cannot be instituted if petitioner has brought a declaratory judgment seeking patent invalidation before filing of IPR. This does not apply to counterclaims. It only applies to a declaratory judgment. So there is some strategy here about whether to file a declaratory judgment or to, to bring an IPR proceeding. If a declaratory judgment action is brought on or after the date of the IPR petition, the civil action is automatically stayed unless the patent owner moves to lift the stay, the patent owner files uh, an infringement suit or counterclaims for infringement, or the petitioner moves to dismiss uh, de declaratory judgment actions. So there's a lot of uh, interesting case law developing about uh, the scope of the stay and, and when these stays can be and can be implemented. And we'll talk a little bit about this in terms of uh, uh, some other aspects of litigation strategy. In the virtual agility case from 2014, uh, the Federal Circuit reversed the district court denial of stay of infringement action when the PTAB review was initiated. So uh, it seems like there's some interesting standards that are developing here regarding uh, district court discretion as to whether to grant the stay or not. Just judging from the virtual agility stay, uh, case, um, the district court probably uh, is almost required to grant these these stays if the statutory requirements are met, but that's again something that's developing and may be the subject of future uh, uh, case law. So in the Quozo case, you had Garmin that brought the IPR to challenge Quozo's patent before the PTAB, introducing several pieces of prior art to show the patent was invalid on grounds of lack of novelty and non-obviousness. PTAB finds a reasonable likelihood of success on non-obviousness challenge for some of the claims, but denies the petition on other grounds. Uh, the PTAB ends up canceling three of the claims on non-obviousness grounds, and the Federal Circuit affirms over Quozo's appeal, both saying, you know, the, the decision to institute was fine, broadest reasonable interpretation was fine, as well as the finding of non-obviousness was fine. Uh, again, the analysis by the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court adopts some of this is that uh, there's availability of mandamus, there are other types of uh, administrative procedures, there might be an action under the APA when there's a, a final judgment uh, to challenge the administrative decision. So even though it may be non-reviewable uh, uh, as an interlocutory matter, there, is, there are still some avenues of process left open uh, for patent owners who question the, uh, the institution of the uh, of the, uh, of the proceeding. As far as broadest reasonable interpretation, it's not in the statute, so there's nothing in the statute that says anything about uh, uh, this approach to claim interpretation. Arguably, there's nothing in the statute that says anything about Markman hearings or anything else either regarding claim construction, so we're dealing with this fuzzy area that may be more in the common law of patents, judge-made law of patents. But the practice of the USPTO has been in the context of examinations, interferences, and re-examination to use this particular standard, and therefore the, the agency uh, should be given Chevron deference. In other words, if there's some ambiguity in the rule uh, or in the statute that, that gives the agency authority, then the agency can adopt a reasonable interpretation to fill that gap. And so the view was that's what the agency is doing here. The Federal Circuit did adopt a fairly broad view of Chevron, Chevron deference. The Supreme Court does uh, adopt a deferential approach to the USPTO on this grounds uh, in this context, but there's an argument that they weren't as deferential as, uh, as the way in which the Federal Circuit wrote its opinion, and we can com compare and contrast that in a minute. Judge Newman, as, as often the case, wrote a really uh, interesting dissent. It's always good to talk about this. Um, even though she didn't win the battle, so to speak, or win the war, she put out some really interesting points. 
how that probably will still come up you know, as these issues regarding IPRs uh, 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 continue. And so uh, her first point is that the post-grad proceeding is a type of adjudication. It's not really agency action. It's different from uh, patent prosecution. And so this question of Chevron deference or def deference to agencies in rulemaking may be, uh, may be inappropriate. Uh, the broadest reasonable interpretation is examination expedient. It's really about the prosecution process. Uh, the public notice function of patents. Remember, these IPRs arise after the patent has been granted, so the patent has been published. The claims, you know, people, anybody can look at them, the public can see them. And so her point then is that this public notice function is defeated uh, by the BRI, by that standard. There's limited opportunity to amend in the IPR. There's only really one opportunity. And so in terms of dealing with an adverse interpretation of the claims under the BRI standard. The patent owner has very little opportunity uh, to deal with that, that, that adverse uh, interpretation. Uh, and so here the, the judge also makes an interesting point that we often think about deference to agency when they're implementing a statute. Here she makes the point that really the agency is changing the statute. Uh, they're actually adding language in some ways uh, to the statute. Uh, which, as we said, doesn't really address the standard for uh, claim uh, interpretation and construction. And so the deference uh, should not be given when the, the statute is being changed in, in such a way. So what, what's at issue in this case very broadly? I mean, even if, though the Federal Circuit gets affirmed, um, you know, it's interesting to see this in terms of the Federal Circuit versus Supreme Court. This can be important for the upcoming cases uh, before the court. Uh, involving patent law. Um, you know, in the, in the Quoza case, largely it had to do with how Congress construed the statute and drafted the statute. Um, so we weren't talking about special rules created by the Federal Circuit. So uh, the issue of deference or uh, affirming the Federal Circuit is maybe not that surprising. Effectively, the Supreme Court is just affirming Congress, not the Federal Circuit. Uh, this really is involving the interpretation of the patent st uh, statute. And so largely the bigger question structurally is what is the place of the USPTO in the scheme of patent law? Should the courts uh, really interfere and review what they do? And the, uh, the ultimate bottom line in Quozo from that perspective is that the courts should really kind of defer more to the USPTO. At least we get a narrow ruling in the context of inter partes review where there is this, uh, this deference to the Patent and Trademark Office as opposed to the Federal Circuit or the courts more generally. Uh, in terms of judicial review type issues, uh, typically the, tip, the things that come up are common law patent rules, protection of patent donors, protection of patent system. Um, I think in this particular case of Quozo, the Supreme Court is really looking at the third of these, uh, really considering the protection of the patent system to make sure that patents aren't granted to questionable patents. Uh, there's a lot of controversy over IPRs. Um, uh, you know, one prominent um, or ex-member of the Federal Circuit uh, talked about the uh, PTAB in the context of IPR as death panels. I think that's public, and so I don't feel too bad repeating that. Uh, and so that gives you a sense, some sense of the tenor of, uh, of the conversation regarding uh, these proceedings. But uh, nonetheless, there is this notion, which I think the Supreme Court affirmed, that, that there should be some review of patents to make sure uh, you know, that you check the patent office's homework, so to speak, uh, to make sure that the system is not granting uh, invalid or, or worthless patents. So continuing on this line then, uh, you've got the Supreme Court holding in Quozo, just to, uh, to summarize this again, uh, unanimous on the issue of the broadest reasonable interpretation, but there was a split six to two on the issue of judicial review with Justices Alito and Sotomayor, uh, conservative and liberal judges working in harmony here, uh, justices working in harmony here, basically saying that there should be more scope for judicial review of the decision to institute the IPR, and that uh, is something that uh, uh, the, 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 they really would overrule the statute uh, that limits that type of judicial review. Um, the court upholds the statutory provision limiting judicial review as within Congress's power. Uh, so six justices agreed with that. Uh, 
especially since there are alternative mechanisms for review, such as mandamus, that still exist. Uh, unanimously, 8-0, the court upholds broadest reasonable interpretation standard as valid exercise of agency power and as grounded in longstanding practice. Uh, if Justice Scalia had survived, it would be interesting to see where he would have stood on this. He's not necessarily been a strong fan of administrative agencies in other areas. Uh, he's been critical of things like Chevron deference, for example. So it would have been interesting to see uh, you know, what he would have thought about this. Uh, the aspect of longstanding practice is something that he might have found as a more convincing argument uh, than the exercise of agency power, but that, that's kind of a missed opportunity, among other things, in terms of how he would have dealt with uh, the, the agency in this particular context. And so some of the implications for practice and tech commercial commercialization of the Quozo case. Mandamus uh, is possible under three requirements. And so mandamus is something, is a proceeding that allows agency, a review of agency decision making. There's no other adequate means to obtain relief. The right to issuance of writ is, is, is clear and indisputable. It's appropriate under the circumstances. And so the Procter and Gamble case deals in part with this, this particular standard. Um, and so that's an open question of how mandamus might work in these types of cases if parties, uh, patent owners specifically, uh, you know, start pursuing that avenue uh, to challenge the institution of, uh, of IPRs and, and by extension PGRs. Um, there's extra care and burdens in seeking patent protection, so um, you really want to get it right as the patent applicant and make sure that your patent becomes bulletproof especially since it is uh, subject to these post-grant proceedings and the petitioners who bring those proceedings you know, got a real gift, got a real sort of strong support uh, with the Quozo ruling, both on the, the standard of, rev of reviewing the claims as well as on the, the judicial review uh, prong of this. One interesting area in, in, with these PTAP proceedings is the, the role of settlement. Uh, there is settlement that's possible for IPR proceedings. It has to be approved by the, uh, by the, by the, by the, by the panel. Uh, and um, these IPRs, uh, even though they're broad, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me right now, a lot of them do result in settlements. And so, you know, even though there is a big talk about the, the death panels, uh, that rhetoric doesn't stand up to the statistics. Because first of all, uh, even though maybe the, the IPR proceedings are brought, a good proportion the, of them settle. And the ones that actually you know, go to some final judgment by the, uh, by the, by the board uh, don't necessarily result in the patent being uh, invalidated. Uh, so it, it's kind of an extreme situation. It sort of should be obvious to say that uh, you know, the PTAB and the IPR is where patents go to basically die or be killed. Uh, it's a lot more dynamic process. And so these settlements are interesting. We don't have the terms of the settlements, but it's interesting to see what types of cases uh, result in a settlement and uh, whether they're repeat players and so forth. And that's the subject of um, some ongoing work by practitioners and scholars, including myself. And maybe we'll have some time in a future webinar uh, to discuss settlements in PTAP proceedings as well as other contexts. And finally, we had that uh, little slide about litigation strategy, uh, this whole issue of automatic stays and the role of de declaratory judgments. Again, it's something that's going to get worked out in the case law, but it's something worth uh, keeping in mind uh, as you're advising clients and, and bringing uh, these types of things. So even though we think about tech commercialization largely in terms of licensing issues, and, and licensing issues may seem far removed from some of the things we've talked about in the context of Quozo, the whole issue of patent validity is, going to, is an ongoing issue and needs to be thought about even by folks who may be doing more transactional work uh, because that uh, uh, you have a patent license. One of the ways in which the patent license might be challenged is by looking at the, or the, the invalidity of, uh, of a particular patent. And uh, if you're within the time frame, the IPR and the PGR is one avenue for challenging validity. Okay, so the third case that was decided uh, last term is Kirtsang versus Wiley. This has to do with attorney's fees and copyright cases. This case uh, didn't get as much of a splash. In some ways, it's a pretty 
uh, straightforward case, uh, but it's worth talking about. Uh, so the brief background is that Kirtsang wa uh, won the copyright infringement suit brought by Wiley. Uh, uh, Kirtsang was a graduate student from Thailand. He was studying, I think, at Cornell and then at UCLA. And what he was doing was buying books cheaply in Thailand and reselling them in the U.S. I think there's some indication of the records that he made millions of dollars from this practice, but certainly he made enough to cover his you know, cost of living in Ithaca and in, in Los Angeles as well as the cost of schooling uh, from this practice, and I think he probably had some money left over. Uh, so when this was first challenged uh, by Wiley, you know, Kurt Sang won in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, basically the U.S. Supreme Court adopting an international adopt, uh, exhaustion principle uh, for copyright law in 2013. So the case gets remanded for, for uh, other considerations, including the, the uh, motion for attorney's fees. And so the motion was denied uh, because the district court found Wiley's position objectively reasonable. So again, we get into this question of what the standard should be for attorney's fees. Kirtsen argued, however, that he should have gotten attorney's fees because he had pursued a novel legal theory and was successful. So his view was that uh, you know, one of the reasons why you might grant attorney's fees to the winning side is they took on a lot of risk in terms of uh, pursuing the litigation, and then especially if they were successful, and, and even more so if they were able to be successful against all odds, so to speak, because the Supreme Court adopted some new law, then the award of attorney's fees uh, uh, should be granted. So uh, the district court ruled against Kirt Sang and attorney's fees, and then he, in, a, in another unanimous decision, uh, the Supreme Court vacated uh, the denial of attorney's fees with a remand. And so the court ruled that the district court should consider all relevant factors with substantial weight on the reasonableness of the losing party's position. So this is slightly different than what the court said in octane fitness. Um, Octane Fitness, uh, you know, that's an attorney's fees case in the patent context. The court talked about looking at the totality of the circumstances and didn't necessarily say that one factor was more important than, than the other. Here the court is saying that, you know, you should look to see objectively whether the losing party did have a, a reasonable position, and that should be a fairly big factor in deciding whether they should uh, have to pay attorney's fees. The court faulted the district court for ruling that reasonableness created a presumption against fees. So the court rejects this notion that there's a, any sort of presumption. They do want this sort of totality of the circumstances, it seems. Uh, and, and that's sort of where they're remanding with this little caveat about um, uh, the reasonableness as being a, you know, an important factor in this uh, totality analysis. So this is an interesting decision. I mean, it shows the court's interest in attorney's fees. It shows some uh, inconsistency between the patent uh, standard and the copyright standard. But uh, you know, this case, they'll follow this case and let you know how, what the district court does uh, upon remand uh, uh, re with the respect to the attorney's fees motion. So those are the three cases last term. Uh, I think one certainly very big case, uh, Quozo versus Lee, that has some very, imp very important implications. Uh, for patent practice. Uh, the HALO case, very important for litigation and willfulness, especially overruling you know, a 10-year-old precedent from the Federal Circuit that had a lot of people kind of, uh, uh, kind of not sure what to do with uh, in terms of the Federal Circuit's two-part test. And so there's a brave new world for enhanced damages. And then you know, in terms of this attorney's fees issues, there's still some things that are being you know, worked out both in the patent area and in the copyright area. So now we've got a whole you know, set of cases that are before the court uh, this term. And I just want to go through these very quickly. Uh, we've got about 10, 15 minutes left. So uh, I'm not going to go, I'll talk briefly about what the lower courts did and the issues that the court is reviewing in these cases and also give you a sense of the, you know, what's at stake. This one's a pretty interesting case. It has to do with copyright protection for designs. Uh, these are the, uh, the designs at issue. Um, <coughs> The copyright uh, in these cheerleader outfits is owned by Varsity, uh, varsity Brands. And uh, it's a patent, a cop excuse me, a copyright infringement lawsuit brought against Star Athletica. And we're not getting to the infringement analysis here. We're just simply getting here 
about the copyright ownership. And so Star Athletica had been challenging, you know, whether there's anything original or creative here under copyright law uh, that deserves copyright protection. Uh, these copyrights are registered. As, as you know, the copyrights have to be registered before you bring a lawsuit uh, to, 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 to uh, enforce uh, infringement. Um, so these were registered, and one of the issues uh, that uh, that was raised is, you know, what deference or what role does the, the registration have? Uh, we know that under the statute, the registration can create some sort of, uh, you know, is enough to make a prima facie case of, of ownership. And so the Star Athletic was sort of challenging, you know, what relevance the, the registration has as far as uh, originality or creativity. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, didn't review that question. The Star Athletica did, a, uh, excuse me, they did ask to review that particular question, Varsity Brands, but uh, the Supreme Court didn't grant review in that particular question. Instead, they brought, uh, they, they decided to review the question of the underlying copy, copyrightability of the designs here. Uh, Varsity Brands are losing at, in the lower court level and then bringing this lawsuit. Uh, the question that, um, uh, that's in front of the court is, uh, what is the appropriate test to determine when a feature of a useful article is protectable under Section 101 of the Copyright Act? And it, it, it didn't grant cert on the issue of copyright registration, as I just mentioned. And so this question, of the useful article doctrine, uh, you know, exists under Section 101. It applies to works that are pictorial or graphical or uh, sculptural in nature. And so people may be familiar with these cases. There's a really interesting line of cases. They involve all sorts of uh, works, uh, dressmaker dummies, uh, mannequin heads uh, that are used in cosmetology school, um, lamps, um, clocks, uh, you name it. There are all these sorts of works that have both functional features as well as aesthetic features. And copyright law is meant to only protect the aesthetic features, not the functional features. Functional features, if at all, can be protected by patents. So this is kind of a real, uh, you know, seminal question, foundational question about the line between copyright and patents, as well as the specific question about uh, when you determine when something is copyrightable. And uh, you know, this stuff has been litigated since at least the 50s. There's some lots of cases beforehand, but uh, they came up to the fore, you know, as design became more of a uh, more of an industry and a field you see a lot of these cases coming up uh, you know since the 1950s the 1976 copyright act has expressed statutory language that deals with this particular issue and there's lots of litigation under that statute the sixth circuit uh, that ruled against varsity brands here so this is the intermediate appellate court uh, basically identified nine tests that courts have come up with uh, to determine copyrightability for useful articles. And, uh, you know, I won't go through all nine of those tests, uh, but largely they you know, have to do with some sort of separability. So, for example, if you can physically separate the sculptural or the aesthetic aspects of a work from the functional aspects. So, you know, take the example of a clock. If you can somehow take out all the functional aspects, all the clockwork, and you're left with something that looks like a, a sculpture or a statue, then you've got something that can be copyrightable. It gets a lot more complicated when you're dealing with designs, like on, like this, like this, the, to go back a little bit, like here. I mean, what do you separate uh, in terms of figuring out what's functional? So clearly, these armholes here, you know, have a functional dimension, but they're also aesthetic. I mean, they they, they sort of have some kind of. A, a uh, you know, pleasing feature or whatever it might be. Same thing with collars. I mean, how do you separate, you know, all the, d the elements of things that are functional for clothing from things that, that look good? They, they somehow seem inextricably mixed or mess, uh, intertwined. And if they are inextricably intertwined, the copyright owner loses. Because if you can't separate them, then, you know, the court is very hesitant to grant copyright protection to things that really should be not copyrighted. And so that's why the lots of litigation on these issues, and this is why it's especially interesting for the fashion industry, uh, because they're you know heavily invested in protecting the aesthetic features, even though 
there are lots of folks who say, well, fashion is just, uh, it just basically has to, the dress has to stay up, or it has to fit the body in a particular way, or it has to keep you warm. So it really is not, it's really functional rather than purely aesthetic. So the Sixth Circuit adopted a test that required the court to identify utilitarian features first and then ask whether these can exist separately from aesthetic features when looked at from the perspective of an objective viewer. And so that's one of the nine tests or maybe a hybrid of some of these nine tests. And so what the Supreme Court is going to be doing uh, is really look at what the lower courts have been doing for the last, you know, 40, 50 years and try to figure out an answer to this question. I don't feel all that optimistic that they're going to come up with an answer. I don't know if there is one right test. So most likely what the Supreme Court is going to do, it would be interesting to see what their analysis and discussion here is, but most likely what they're going to do is just lay out, you know, you know distill from these nine tests some fairly abstract and general principles and basically tell the district courts, run with these. Uh, to see how they would apply in practice. But it will be interesting to say, maybe there is one test out there that really resolves questions about how to decide the copyrightability of a, of a dress, uh, but I'm skeptical about that. But nonetheless, uh, this, this case has a lot of people excited. Uh, academics are excited, practitioners are excited, people in the fashion industry are excited, uh, because the, the court really hasn't dealt with a good design case in a long time. And as you can see, with nine tests that the lower courts have come up with, there's been a lot of controversy you know, at the lower court level. So SCA hygiene is about latches. So this is really purely in the litigation context. Uh, latches is sort of an equitable uh, statute of limitations, has the, uh, the, the patent uh, owner sat on her rights too long uh, to bring the suit. So this is typically asking that even if you're within the statute of limitations period, you still should be barred or time barred from bringing the suit because you didn't bring the suit in, in, a, in, a, in a timely fashion. And so the highlights on the, of this case, uh, main question under review is whether and to what extent the defense of latches applies within the six-year statute of limitations for patent infringement claims. This, as I mentioned before, is a follow-up to the Supreme Court decision in Petrella versus Metro Golden Mayor. Really interesting case involving the movie uh, Raging Bull. And uh, Petrella was, uh, is a, I think, granddaughter. I forget exactly what her relationship is of, of Jake LaMotta and uh, uh, lots of questions about um, uh, the copyright in the underlying material that became the, the movie Raging Bull. And so um, Rage of Bull came out in 1980, so this kind of latches issues is pretty interesting in terms of uh, you know, how long a copyright owner can sit on her rights. But the court in that case basically held that latches does not apply within the three-year statute of limitations for copyright infringement claims. So you basically follow the statute. This is another one of these opinions that basically says follow what Congress says rather than trying to create some sort of judge-made rule about equitable statute of limitations. And this is another case where the court gets to review the Federal Circuit because in the Ackerman case from 1992, the Federal Circuit has ruled to allow latches. So on the one hand, you've got this asymmetry, no latches under copyright law, under Petrella. Federal Circuit says there are latches under patent law. No reason why patent law and copyright law should be exactly the same, but you know, it raises some interesting practice questions if they are different especially since uh, you know, a, 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 an attorney might have a client who has both patent issues and copyright issues. You need to kind of keep those straight if there are different uh, legal standards that apply there. So very interesting to see what will happen in this case on a number of levels, copyright versus patent, and then again, Supreme Court versus Federal Circuit. Apple versus Samsung, really fun case. Uh, the battle between... Um, uh, 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 smartphones, um, and this has to do with the damages uh, for design patent. The question under review is whether um, a design patent applies to only a component of a product. Uh, should a district court be required to limit its award of infringers' profits to those profits attributable to the components? So basically we're asking for apportionment. Um, if you have, let's say, uh, in this case, it's a design patent, over the shape of an iPhone, do you get the full how much? Let's uh, you know, do you get the full six hundred dollars? Let's say that's what we say the, the 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 price of that iPhone is. Uh, 
Um, somebody buys uh, the Samsung product rather than the iPhone, so Apple is out $600. Should, should Apple be able to recover the full $600 or only the portion that's somehow attributable to the design? So if the court says there should be some, uh, some attribution or apportionment, then there are these hidden issues about how you're going to apportion, right? So what portion of the value of, a, of an iPhone is to its design, what portion is to its functional components and so forth. So, you know, if the court does rule in favor of apportionment, that's going to open up some very interesting litigation in the future. The Federal Circuit held against separability and against apportionment, basically following uh, the, the, the statute, which basically says you get the full value of the product uh, in the design patent statute. And so this is an interesting case, not only because of the smartphone wars, but also because of another case involving design protection. So you got two cases where the Supreme Court is addressing this question of design protection you know, after, several, uh, after several decades. So for those who are, who are in that area of the law, uh, and that's an increasingly growing area of the law, it's pretty exciting uh, developments. Okay, so the, the last cases that the court has decided so far is Life Technologies versus Promega. And this has to do with liability under 271F1 of the patent statute. And the question that the court is, is reviewing is, does supplying a single component of a multi-component invention from the United States constant, pa constitute patent infringement, exposing the manufacturer liability for worldwide sales? So the product is under patent in the US. Uh, somebody uh, exports uh, some components of the, of the product overseas, uh, and the, the product is actually put together overseas where it's not infringing and then it's going to be sold uh, worldwide, uh, what should be the nature of liability for the people who provided the components. And here specifically you're dealing with processes, so this makes another a little, a little nuance to this case. The Federal Circuit says it does, uh, the statute does impose liability even if you're just applying a single component, and so the Supreme Court will review both the statute Another interesting case where the court has to kind of look at the statute, look at the Federal Circuit interpretation, and making, make some decision. And so, you know, this case is interesting, not just simply for the, 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 the specific technical issue of components and patent infringement, but also this question about uh, U.S. law applying, you know, outside uh, uh, its borders. And so we'll have some opportunity probably later on uh, this year to talk about this case. So just to quickly sum up uh, some implications for practice overall uh, based upon you know, these four cases, what to look out for. Court is focused on specific practical aspects of intellect. These are pretty nitty-gritty cases. They're technical cases about the statute. They're about statute of limitations. They're about damages, about copyrightability. So really very, very uh, practical type cases. The court is concerned with judicial administration of intellectual property especially the role of district courts and the relationship to the federal circuit. And the last point that a number of people have made is that there are only eight justices on the court. I don't know whether, whether we're going to get a ninth or, and when we'll get a ninth or even who that ninth person uh, might be. And so one of the reasons why some people are speculating that the court has taken so many IP cases is, well, I guess they want to have fun too, but they're less willing to take controversial cases. So especially if they're going to be divided in this way with potential 4-4 four, four votes. Intellectual property cases is one area where they've gotten fairly good unanimity across, uh, across lines. And so that may be one reason why we've seen you know, you know, the, the spate of cases. And, and I think people expect to see more, actually, this term. A um, um, couple of cases involving First Amendment and, and, and trademark law um, and so forth uh, that, that the court might, might grant. And so as far as uh, technology transfer, the things to look out for, you know, what is, what is protected as intellectual property? Is something copyrightable, right? What is protected by design? These are kind of very important uh, questions to keep in mind when you're drafting licenses and when you're trying to negotiate transfers of intellectual property. You need to be aware of administrative procedures such as the IPR and registration, litigation threats, uh, to what extent is that being mitigated by uh, changing the standard for uh, attorney's fees or changing the standard for enhanced damages. And it's interesting to think about the general attitudes towards commercialization and technology. 
you know, one of the reasons why the court might be granting these cases is that it is a court, you know, both uh, on liberal and conservative lines that is concerned about how the law is affecting business. Uh, and so it's not surprising from that perspective that they are taking a lot of these IP cases over, over the last several years uh, because of its importance for uh, commercialization technology and the kind of things that uh, many of us and, and many lawyers are practicing today. So thanks for your patience. I hope uh, this was informative. I look forward to taking any, any questions you might have either now or, or afterwards.